It's the week of Halloween, 1985, and Misha and Diane are watching Santa Barbara. Hello. This is week 66 of Santa Barbara, and I don't remember what Halloween costume I wore in 1985, so I've picked a random one. Uh, it is, of course, till Monday, October 28th, 1985, so we still have a few days before Halloween. <clears throat> and we should uh, mention something that we didn't mention yesterday. The party um, has been explicitly stated now to be on a Wednesday. Uh, as you might recall, Eden's party was going to be on Saturday, but that was just around the time that three episodes were preempted. Mm -hmm. And so they actually, in the dialogue, uh, said that the party was going to be on Wednesday, which makes sense, because the Friday episode um, that would have aired before that Saturday is now airing on a Wednesday. So um, they've, re they've rewritten some scenes, even you know at such short notice, uh, to, to write in that it's Wednesday, um, but we'll probably be getting some cliffhangery stuff on Wednesdays for for a couple of weeks before they can they can actually tailor their writing to uh, to uh, a Friday cliffhanger. And uh, Wednesday is actually the 30th of October, whereas you know in the original plans it would have aired the 20 whatever so of October. So I don't know if they have any Halloween plans this year, and if those are going to end up being bumped by three days, too. Um, it seems weird to have a party on Saturday, then to have another Halloween party the, on the Wednesday. So maybe there aren't any Halloween plans, and it won't seem too weird. And in fact, it may be even better to have a, a party on Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. And then we'll get what would have been Saturday, a.k.a. Monday, on Thursday. But anyway... Just thought I would uh, update you all on that, because I'm sure that was foremost on your mind. Kirk tells Cruz that that hammer slipped out of his hands. He says, I lost my temper because I found out you're checking into my past. And Cruz tells Kirk that he could have him arrested for breaking and entering. And then Kirk says he won't tell Eden what Cruz is up to if Cruz lets it drop. No, actually, I'm not sure now uh, if he's talking about uh, the fact that he thinks Eden will be annoyed if she finds out that Cruz is investigating Kirk, or also um, the surprise of the beach house. Uh, it actually wasn't clear to me by the end of that scene which which thing he was was agreeing not to tell Eden. Yeah, I I actually wouldn't necessarily see Eden being that upset over either of those. I don't know. Um, I guess perhaps she wouldn't like the idea of Cruz sneaking around and investigating one of her employees. That one might upset her. Um, she's going to have her gift revealed fairly soon, we hope. So, um, yeah, the only other thing I thought um, was about Cruz getting back on the police force, but... Um, that's Eden's surprise for him. But that's Eden, yes, but... But, uh, no, but I, I mean, oh, she okay. doesn't, sorry, so. No, even surprises the captaincy. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know either. So then, uh, Eden and Kirk are hanging out, and Eden gets a call, and she finds out that Cruz got the promotion to captain. And she excitedly kisses Kirk's face several times, mm -hmm. which was, uh. Uh, a bit surprising, yeah, possibly Kirk was just as surprised as we were. Um, but, um, yeah, that's quite a rapid promotion from firefighter to police officer to a captain in a few short months. Yeah, but, no, I'm just still trying to think when Cruz uh, left that meeting where he was expecting to get into a great deal of trouble and he ended up being reinstated on the force. Mm -hmm. I don't think he was being reinstated yeah, you know, at a high level, he was just no. Being he was just being reinstated as an officer. Yeah. But then Eden got Kirk to get Julia to call her friend, the commissioner's wife. Yes, that's right. To try to get Cruz, you know, up to a higher level. So, and I think probably from the police department standpoint, uh, if he's going to be a loose cannon, they'd rather not have him on the streets. So, yeah, yeah. have him behind a desk. I don't know if Kirk Cruz is going to necessarily want to be behind a desk, so... I don't think so. I don't think so. Eden tells Cruz that she thinks Gina destroyed those papers, but uh, 
Chris thinks that maybe she, there might be a reason that she didn't, so Eden asks the world's greatest detective if he could find them. So Cruz asks Rosa if she's seen Gina with any papers in the last little while, and Rosa says she's pretty sure that Gina had hidden some papers in the plaster in one of the pillars. So even if we didn't maybe see Rosa, she was probably skulking around in those episodes. So uh, that's kind of interesting. Those times we saw Gina running across the room with papers, maybe. Maybe Rosa spotted her. Well, if they're all living in the same house, you know, there's probably not really a lot of secrets, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Cruz calls home to find that Kirk is at the houseboat, and uh, he answers, and he lies and says Eden's in the shower, when she's actually gone out to water the plants. And Cruz says, well, tell her, tell her to get herself over to her house. And Kirk says, would you like me to help dry her off just to speed things up? And Cruz says, you're skating on thin ice, pal. So, I like this Cruz-Kirk uh, rivalry. It's mm. kind of fun. Cruz tells Eden that he thinks Gina has the papers, but he's not allowed to search their house unless he's invited to by a member of the family. Um, this conversation happens at the front door uh, of the house, and uh, she gives him carte blanche to search the house, and uh, they enter the house, and Cruz slams the door in Kirk's face. Uh, Gina takes the batteries out of one of the nurse's beepers and tells Cece, who's not actually in the room at the time, in fact, she's in her own room, but she's just talking to Cece, um, that he will soon be paying for all the trouble he's caused. Uh, then she catches Eden searching her room, and, uh, once again, Eden is holding that box that has the dress in it, but Gina stops her just in time. And then she's, uh, you know... Uh, aware that Eden's actually looking for the documents, and so um, she um, she realizes that uh, a search is happening, and she ends up hiding, I don't know if she hides the papers, but she definitely hides the dress and the wig in one of Brandon's giant teddy bears. So, uh, and then she calls an agency to audition some 65-year-old men for a radio <laughs> commercial she's producing. So I have a feeling she's going to get them to say something in Cece's voice, or close to Cece's voice, that she can maybe, if she drugs Eden again, maybe she can make Eden hallucinate that Cece was talking to her or something like that. Of course, as we know, being people who have been watching uh, police whodunits for, for many years now, um, the more complicated you make a potential murder plot, the more... Um, possibility there is that you will be caught. Mm-hmm. Gina's plan has quite a lot of working parts, let's say. And we don't even know what it is. So. Sam reveals himself to be alive, which we saw at the end of the last episode. Dylan is, of course, looking into his coffin. And um, so Dylan arranges to have that coffin shipped to Nick's house with Sam in it. Uh, because they're wor worried that Carlo's men are all over the place. And in fact, one of them is at the airport and has witnessed the whole thing. And he phones Carlo. And we finally see Carlo, played by Joe Muscolo, best known for over 35 years, I think, as Stefano De Mera on Days of Our Lives. Um, he did not have an accent. He's doing his own New York accent. Um, so... Uh, I had a feeling that they were on a yacht, and I think that was uh, sort of evidence later when uh, mm -hmm. the captain or someone comes down and says that they'll be landing in Santa Barbara soon, or arriving in Santa Barbara soon. Um, so the coffin gets delivered to Nick's place while Nick and Kelly are in the shower, and uh, Dylan hasn't arrived yet, and uh, Kelly ends up finding the coffin and sees Sam rising out of it, and mm. she screams. And Kelly has started a new thing today. She calls Nick Nicky now. Mm -hmm. She called him Nicky at least twice. So maybe, uh, maybe they'll be together forever. And Dylan won't come between them at all. Um, Dylan arrives, and Sam reveals that he has the map with him in the coffin. And uh, they reveal that they each have different bruises from Carlo's diamond ring. Uh, Dylan has like a huge welt up here, and I guess Sam's back is covered with 
damage from when they were interrogating him. Um, Nick assumes that Carlo... Nick assumes that Carlo is on his way to Santa Barbara and wants to spell and wants to spare Kelly from any more peril. He says she's had a rough two years. And uh, Kelly chimes in and says, Oh, this all sounds like fun! So she wants to go on an adventure for a gold mine now. Mm -hmm. She wasn't that into it before, so something's changed. It must be her opinion of Dylan has changed. So. Well, and I think perhaps, and we see... Nick do this a little more again this episode. Uh, Nick constantly going on about how it's time to settle down and have a family and live in some remote place, which we already know, you know, at the very least, Kelly is enjoying her job with the publisher. So mm -hmm. um, none of these uh, sort of scenarios that Nick is, is putting out there really seem to en encompass that at all. Um, yeah, so I think maybe that's making Kelly a little more interested in a non-ranch, non-family, non-ghost town future. Mm-hmm. Um, so Nick obviously is worried about, uh, just as we were talking about, um, adjacent people to Dylan getting uh, hurt if Carlo shows up. So Nick tells Dylan uh, to stay away from Janice and Kelly. Uh, so that they're not caught in the crossfire if Carlo does show up. Um, they tell Dylan that he can stay at Sally's. And uh, Carlo's henchman arrives at the door. Uh, Nick, Dylan, and Sam run into him on their way out and manage to defeat him without alerting Kelly to the fact that there was a scuffle right outside the door. And Nick tells the henchman to tell Carlo that if he comes near Kelly, Janice, or Dylan, he'll eat the map. Mm -hmm. Uh, Nick goes back inside and tells Kelly to stay away from Dylan and Sam. Uh-oh, that, uh, um, contrarian spirit we heard about from Rosa might just make her go the other way. Mm -hmm. Kelly is annoyed when Nick forgets to kiss her goodbye. Dylan calls Kelly almost immediately and says she gave him the wrong key, so she races over to Sally's apartment. And um, she asks if Dylan's mad at her, and he says no. Uh, she asks if he's leaving town, and he says he should. Why does she want to know? Uh, Kelly says no reason. Dylan asks if she wants him to stay, and Kelly says, do what you want. Dylan asks, what do you want? She says, I want what Nick wants. Dylan says, I want an answer from you, and it's not Nick's answer. Kelly says, why do you want an answer from me? From from me. From me. So, clearly, Dylan wants Kelly to say that she wants him to stay. And Kelly wants Dylan to say why she wants... He wants her to say that she wants him to stay. I don't know. I've got a bad feeling about Dylan and Kelly. That is it for the convoluted of events of this episode. Uh, so, I assume Carlo may be landing in Santa Barbara for the next day or two? Yes, and I think it's a f fair guess that Kelly will be in danger at some point from this whole thing with Carlo and Dylan and the treasure and so forth, so I'll probably see her kidnapped again. I wonder if they'll wait till after the party, because otherwise they'll be short. You know, a few capwells at those parties. Because mm -hmm. there's always someone who's missing mm -hmm. from, from mm -hmm. these things. Um, yeah, so maybe Carlo will, won't arrive till Thursday after the party. And He'll probably, probably be teasing them. Plus, we have to get back to that uh, plot line with the Lockridges. So I'm hoping we explore that a little mm -hmm. bit. I mean, too. they could be having Cece's funeral on Thursday. Yes, yes. Although Depending I mean, how Gina's plan goes. The possibilities, um, now that we know that he is responsive like he can hear things that might um make things a little bit more dramatic too if one of the catwalk kids recognizes that as well mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i don't know if mary or the other nurse will have noticed that the pattern of his heart changed you know while they were not in the room i don't know if they would review that so i found out recently 
very unexpectedly, that uh, Santa Barbara had called the people from Days of Our Lives and asked if they could borrow the character of Stefano de Mera um, to play the big bad in their Dylan storyline. And they clearly were able to get Joe Mascolo, um, but Days of Our Lives refused to let them use Stefano. So I did some research to see what Stefano's status actually was on, on Days of Our Lives at this point. So it's now October 1985. The last time Stefano was seen on Days of Our Lives was February 1985. Mm -hmm. um, he was after the prism, which he would use to cure his terminal disease. On a catwalk high above the ice in an ice arena, Marlena shot Stefano and he dropped the prism which, of course, exploded and set the ice arena on fire. Marlena and Stefano struggled on the catwalk, and both went over the edge, but Bo Brady was able to grab Marlena and save her, while Stefano fell into the burning ice below. <laughs> I remember seeing that episode, and I always thought it was weird that all of the, the stuff was happening on ice, but uh, everything was on fire. So I thought it was a weird, weird to see exploding prisms on ice uh, start a fire. I don't think prisms usually explode. Oh, these were special magic prisms. After the arena burns down, a body is found and assumed to be Stefano's. So this is this would actually be a good time uh, if anyone wanted to imagine that Stefano, who is a master of disguise and always playing different characters, has perhaps taken on the role of Carlo and is putting on this fake American accent. Uh, while playing Carlo, because uh, everyone in Salem thinks Stefano de Mera is deceased. Now, you are an avid Days of Our Lives fan from many years back, and of course an avid Santa Barbara fan, and yet, you know, if, if that was the idea, it was completely lost on you, wasn't it? Because you didn't even know that he was playing the character of Carlo. Well, I, you know, wouldn't have been seeing too many episodes, if any at all, um, of Santa Barbara, uh, and if I had only heard them on audio, I may not have realized it was Joe Muscolo playing um, Carlo, because he was not doing the accent. So it's quite possible that I listened to all the episodes with Carlo in them, and uh, never realized that it was potentially Stefano de Mera. So they had this built-in special Easter egg just for people who loved Santa Barbara and Days of Our Lives, and you, probably the one person who they were aiming it at, didn't get it. Exactly. But now I have, and now I'll be looking to see if there's any counter evidence that could, that could uh, thwart the possibility that he's actually Stefano in disguise. I mean, I figure they've they figured, as long as he's not doing an accent, they can't sue us, I guess. And that is it for a Monday episode, which really was a Tuesday episode? A Wednesday episode. I don't know. We're three days ahead. Um, we'll be back after we watch episode 319 of Santa Barbara. See you then. Bye. I'm not Brick's father. How, How can that... you be so sure? I am not in the habit of impregnating women and then forgetting about it. I am um, going for a walk, Augusta. I'm going to think for a while. Well, you should have done that before you decided to father half the population of Santa Barbara. Welcome back. Hello. It's Tuesday, October 29th, 1985, and we have watched episode 319 of Santa Barbara. Earlier tonight, we watched a Barnaby Jones and a Robin Strand was in the credits. And I thought, that name sounds familiar. Didn't he play Keith Timmons on Santa Barbara? Turns out he did. Or will, in a year, two, three. Augusta suspects, out of nowhere, it almost seems like the scene started in the middle. Mm -hmm. she, she accuses Lionel of being Brick's father. She asks him how many other women besides Sophia he was having children with while she was in Europe. She says, how old is Brick? Lionel says, 24. She says, 1960. Did you go to the circus and fall in love with a fire eater? 
Uh, she asks him if he ever met Mrs. Wallace before, but he says he may have glimpsed her at the hospital a couple of weeks ago, but he didn't register that, she, that he knew her. Amy and Brick have decided that they're going to fly to Las Vegas to get married, so they tell Julia, but uh, Julia tells them that Lionel and Augusta have already called D.A. Tony Patterson. Uh, Mrs. Wallace arrives, as far as I could tell, to take care of the baby while they're in Las Vegas. Because it yeah, didn't seem like she was going like. with them. Yeah. So that was kind of weird. I think she'd want to be at the wedding, and so would Marissa. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially since they're inviting Kelly and Dylan, to, or Kelly and Nick, to come along. Maybe so. it's, they're going to have a little family thing afterwards or something. So Mrs. Wallace arrives. Julia mentions to Lionel and Augusta that Brick and Amy are going to Las Vegas to get married. Now, that was kind of dumb. It's kind of like Rosa now, just billing everything. So, of course, uh, Augusta calls Tony Patterson, and Julia goes to the airport to warn them to get on the plane as soon as possible, but as she's trying to usher them through the gate, they get arrested. Or now, Brick, Brick does. One of the things I, I found interesting, we saw Julia running around a lot in this episode. She learns that Lionel and Augusta have gone to the DA, so she runs over to warn Brick and Amy um, at the Perkins house. And then um, when she learns that they're going to Las Vegas, she runs back to Lionel and Augusta's house. And I'm not quite sure why, I guess. Well, she does live there. Mentions this to Augusta and realizes they've, you know, that that this might be a very difficult situation for Brick and Amy, and so runs off to the airport again. So she's on the road a lot. Mm -hmm. One thing I found interesting, actually, was when she goes to the Perkins house and learns that Brick and Amy are getting married, and and Brick mentions they have some suspicions about who set him up. And she seems to not really be surprised at all that it could be Augusta, in fact, Mm -hmm. Rick tries not to tell her, and she says, oh, I think I have an idea, sort of. Yeah, he goes, I know, know, you could tell me her name, or something like that. Yeah. But they don't actually come out and say it, do they? But she she knows. Mm -hmm. It's not going to surprise her at all when the truth comes out. And if it's that obvious, you know, certainly Minx is not going to stand for that at all. Yeah. Morgana! is a new character. She is Carlos's masseuse. Sorry, Carlos masseuse. Now, Dylan made the same mistake in this episode. He called him Carlos and then said, oh, I mean Carlo. So, I'm not the only one. Uh, Carlo tells one of his thugs that he'll be lost at sea if he doesn't find Dylan and Sam by the end of the day. Uh, so I think they're now offshore. And set, they're docked in Santa Barbara in the harbor. So, uh, I assume he's on a big yacht. Maybe Warren should put something in the paper. Big Yacht arrives in Santa Barbara. Kelly brings Dylan and Sam some breakfast, even though Nick had told her to stay away and that he was going to bring them breakfast. Hmm. Don't like that. Don't like that, Kelly bringing Dylan breakfast for no reason. Sam spots some suspicious trucks outside. Uh, They realize that Carlo and Morgana planted that coffin that Sam found in Africa so that they could follow him. They were was probably a tracker in the coffin. So, Dylan makes a fake map while Sam rigs up a burglar alarm. Uh, there's also a little wacky thing with the uh, gold nugget getting dropped down the drain, but uh, I've skipped over that. Uh, Janice has come up with a plan to get rich. She plans to enter a contest where the prize is to be the centerfold of a magazine and to win $10,000. Dylan and Sam then keep walking in on her when she's trying to have some private time to take the photos to enter into the contest. And this brings together everything around Janice's casting and their use of pop music because, of course, she's posing for a centerfold, which, of course, is where the actress made her name. Now, I... Sort of just before it happened, I had a flash of that scene where she was taking her photos. So I must have seen this one, or maybe it happens again in the next episode because she didn't quite get finished. And I had thought, I had like a feeling that it was to Giles, J. Giles' band uh, song, Centerfold. But it was actually the song Freeze Frame. So, that was close. 
Um, Kelly and Nick leave for Las Vegas because they got the surprise invitation from Amy and Brick uh, in between the few minutes between the time they decided to get married and went to the airport. Um, Dylan says, don't do anything crazy like have a double wedding. Uh, Kelly shakes her head. Yeah. While Nick says, they might get crazy. Yeah. Kelly then bites her lip and says, no. Yeah. So she's really not feeling Nick as a potential, you know, husband in a day. Yeah. I liked that. That was a, a nice little uh, bit of ad-libbing by Robin Wright. Uh, yeah, it does really good. I was watching Kelly's expression because, of course, now, if it's the benefit of hindsight, I'm watching everything that's happening uh, and not even having been able to see it originally, most likely. So there are lots of little little things that I'm looking out for nowadays. Um, two thugs come to the door and get into a fight with Nick and Dylan. Sorry, uh, Sam and Dylan. So that's... Uh, We'll see who comes out the victor uh, in the next episode, I guess. But clearly they are supposed to kidnap um, Sam and Dylan and take them to Carlo. Now, for all we know, they have already grabbed Nick and Kelly when they came out the door a few minutes earlier. And they're already in the van. So we may have four people on the yacht after all. We'll see. Lionel is at the bar at the Orient Express. And Augusta has invited Katie Wallace to have lunch with her at the Orient Express, which Katie Wallace thought was a bit weird. But she agreed to come, and uh, Augusta has made arrangements with the Mater D to tell her that Augusta's not there yet, and to sit at the bar. And she ends up being seated right next to Lionel, and Augusta watches to see if they know each other, if Lionel is Brick's father. That's an exciting one. It's an exciting thing, I think. Mm -hmm. And that is it for the Tuesday episode. We did have a cast credits. I haven't gone thoroughly through them, but just from memory. Looks like the only new addition is Sam, played by Ty Henderson. Didn't we see him on a police story? The name sounds familiar. Um, and then in the, the non-main cast, I keep forgetting what that's called, we have Katie Wallace, Janice Harrison, Orient Express bartender, and Joe Muscolo as Carlo, with no S. Mm -hmm. And that is it for Tuesday episode. We'll be back after we watch episode 320 of Santa Barbara, and we're almost another 5% of the way through the show. Mm -hmm. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. Lionel magnanimously gave you the day off. Never a chauffeur when you need one. time in my life you haven't been able to shaft me i've never had any effect on my father's heart unless it was to harden it welcome back hello we have watched episode 320 on wednesday october 30th 1985 that's right and we would like to wish a very happy birthday to cc capwell and to me happy birthday diane happy birthday to me Birthday, I CC. am 17 years old. Wow. Nice. And we got you uh, some cake mm -hmm. for your birthday to share with Cece. He's in a coma, so you can have both. Or I can have one. Yeah, that might work too. All right. Happy birthday, Diane. And happy birthday, Cece Capwell. Ma Mason comes into Cece's room and tells Mary it's Cece's birthday. Now, you might not remember Cece's birthday being the same day as yours last year. No, I thought it was a slightly different day last year. Well, Eden mentions that a year ago today, she landed in, well, the Lockridge Yard to surprise Dad on his birthday. That episode aired September 28th, 1984, so Cece's birthday has shifted by over a month. Ah. So that's very interesting. Now, well, my this... birthday was the same. Yes, that didn't change. Plus, you didn't have a, a baseball preemption a week mm. or two ago. So, we don't know really at this point if the writers um, have already adjusted for that and whether it's actually October 30th for them or if they still think it's Friday, October 25th. Mm. So, 
you know, with Halloween around the corner, you'd think there'd be a there'll be an obvious clue if Halloween's three days late that they never were able to rejig that fast enough. Yeah. So Mason says a lot of terrible things to CC uh, in his room for his birthday, and talks about all the presents that he gave CC over the years that CC hated. That if they'd come from Channing, he would have loved them. Now Mary's overhearing all of this. And she's not too, you know. Impressed by the way Mason talks to his comatose father. Um, at one point, each of them notices that Cece's heart rate is increasing on the monitor, mm -hmm. just the way that Gina had noticed the other day. And uh, Mason says, I never had any effect on my father's heart, unless it was to harden it. Uh, and I was not really paying attention, but for some reason he decided to go to Los Angeles. I think it's because... Uh, he said to Mary that he was a monster. So Mary tracks him down at the airport, and it's a different part of the airport than we saw Brick and Amy at. Um, she tells him that she thinks he loves his father. And in the end, he doesn't go to Los Angeles. They go for a walk on the beach together. Eden announces the governor has accepted her invitation to the party, which... Presumably should be tomorrow, right? Because it was going to be Wednesday, and this is the end of the day Wednesday, or towards the end of the day. So I assume the party will be full swing tomorrow. Um, Nick bursts in, saying that Dylan and Sam have gone missing, and it looks like there's been a fight. So Cruz runs away, and somehow Kirk slinks in. And through a series of events... Um, proceeds to suggest to Eden that she should take a bath after all and uh, ends up in the bathroom with her at one point when he thinks it's too quiet in there and mm -hmm. he's worried that you know she's lost in her thoughts about Cece. Anyway um, he sees that she's kind of like a zombie in there says well I think it'd be best if I just hung out in the bathroom but I will turn my back and that's the position that Cruz found them in when Cruz returned and yeah. as you might guess he Punched Kirk in the, in the jaw. Uh, both Kirk and Eden protested to Cruz's actions. So I'm wondering if Eden is going to start the day uh, angry at Cruz. Could be. He spent much of the day, you know, telling Nick, trying to phone Nick to help him finish painting the boathouse or beach house for tomorrow or tonight. And uh, he had a bunch of paint that he was hiding, or painting supplies that he was hiding. I think at one point Eden spotted something that looked like painting supplies. And she says, I just painted your ceiling. And he says, yeah, red. So he covers for that. Uh, Brick is arrested at the airport. Amy says to, to Julia, well, they're coming for me next. I'm going to strangle Augusta. <laughs> and Julia bails uh, Brick out of jail. Lionel, uh, who is at the bar with Katie, uh, starts chatting with her, and uh, Augusta, from a distance, takes that to mean that they actually do know each other. And She bursts in, accuses them of having known each other for years, and accuses Lionel of being Brick's father, mm -hmm. which Katie finds absolutely absurd, especially since for the first half of the conversation she doesn't even know who either of them are. We do learn, however, that she might be aware that uh, Brick's father is different than the man who we've been led to believe is Brick's father. Why do you say that? Well, she says uh, at one point, well, we, when we were on va vacation, or when we were on our honeymoon in Hawaii, um, you know, I was there with Brick's father, and I know who, who the father of Brick was, but that doesn't necessarily mean uh -huh. it's the same person. Interesting. Yes, I didn't catch that because I was I was more focused on writing down what she said next. You know, I we got back from Hawaii and two two weeks later I found out I was pregnant with Brick. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Katie had uh, quite a terrible day with the Lockridges. And I have to say, Augusta did come off as a crazy person in the bar. She did not come across well, and Lionel was. Made, made a point of how poorly she had acted. Mm -hmm. He gets so angry with her that he says to her, well, if you must know, during that period of time when they were on their honeymoon, I was in Los Angeles for weeks on end, spending every single moment with Sophia. 
I didn't want to tell you that, but you left me no choice. Julia then arrives and accuses Augusta of setting up Brick, more or less. Uh, Augusta quickly takes Lionel for a drive before he can really get into that conversation with Julia. Yeah. He seems to be a bit, bit clueless about all the people accusing Augusta over the last few days. Yeah, yeah, he doesn't seem to be as as alert to this as, as perhaps he should be, given his past experience with Augusta. Mm -hmm. He keeps brushing it off whenever someone brings up that possibility. It does make me think, though, that when it is finally revealed one way or another, um, that that will make it an even more impactful thing on Lionel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. It could be a, a chasm between Augusta and Lion, Lionel for a while. Uh, and then she decides uh, that maybe they should even just, not just go for a drive, but maybe stay in, a, in an inn overnight. Mm -hmm. When Brick finds out that they've gone out of town, he has told Amy, well, i got to play things the Lockridge way from now on. He breaks into the house, and he's going through the desk, looking for evidence. But for some reason, Lionel and Augusta wander back into the house while Brick is searching the desk, and Augusta flicks an alarm switch and says they'll be here in two minutes. Wow. So, at least on at this point it looks like things are probably even worse for Brick, and I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up hauled off to jail for a while at this point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it could be. He could be the first person in the Santa Barbara Slammer for year two. We haven't actually had anyone since July 31st in yeah. jail. Now, mind you, I imagine that will rile up Minx even more um, to find that he's actually now in jail. Might also alarm her, though, that he was going through stuff and, and mm -hmm. uh, is, is something that shows her how desperate he is to, to know the truth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Minx is always tantalizingly missing from the episodes when things are happening, and she only finds out afterwards. Uh, at one point, Julia does actually ask Augusta, point blank, if she was the one responsible for mm -hmm. this whole situation. And Augusta says no. And Julia doesn't necessarily believe her, I think, but wants to believe her and kind of persuades herself to believe her. Can tell, says she believes her. Right? Yeah, but yeah. Do we believe Julia any more than we believe Augusta? Well, they are sisters. that's true. Um, but anyway, as a result of, of that, um, and Rick completely gives her permission. She's kind of he hedging a little bit more about being Rick's lawyer. So they agree that um, she can maybe step away a little bit just to think about it. So it'll be kind of interesting to see how that plays out. And again, when the truth is actually revealed, how much more the fact that Augusta looked her sister in the eye and denied it will, will perhaps um, fracture things a little bit mm -hmm. more. Yeah, between Lionel and Julia uh, and Minx, and that really everyone. Augusta doesn't really have any friends. And, you know, the potential friends like Gina, uh, she does not get along with because she's more self-centered about her own yeah. requirements there, so... And I imagine, well, it'll it'll also upset Warren, who's been quite involved in in initiating this investigation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, of course, Lakin isn't there right now, but I'm sure that this would not be something she would be very in favor of either. So, mm -hmm. so on thin ice, I think. Augusta might get kicked out. Might have to move into Sally's place. It's free. Gina encounters Eden at Cece's bedside and retrieves the letter that Eden leaves behind. Uh, Gina then writes a car commercial, uh, which includes several variations on the theme of, I just want to die right now. Um, she auditions three actors in a rented uh, office space, and we see the second one just as he's leaving, and the third one is Russell Johnson, mm -hmm. better known as the professor on Gilligan's Island. So that was exciting to see him. She had uh, ordered three men around the age of 65, so I guess Russell Johnson was around 65 at that point, and I guess presumably Charles Bateman and C.C. Capwell were too. Yeah. So this is a little clue as to the age of C.C., um, plus or minus a month. 
Uh, so Russell Johnson does all the audition pieces, and uh, Gina, of course, is secretly recording. And uh, as she's ushering him out the door, he's trying to give her some headshots. Throws in, you know, I can dance too. <laughs> Gina listens back to her the recording, and she thinks she's found the perfect, perfect line that she will obviously use for ghostly taunting of Eden. So I think Eden probably would need to be drugged again to fully get her to buy that. Yeah, and it'll be interesting um, to to find out how Gina kind of splices it together because she's written it like car ads, and I doubt if Eden would really be be moved by car ads, so I think she'll probably splice it together to, to sound like um, Cece's imploring Eden from beyond the grave, or beyond the near grave. Mm-hmm. And the scene ends with Gina saying, I just love show business, and I was not looking at the screen, but I just I looked up, I think she was saying it directly to camera. Uh, Kirk at one point orders a bunch of flowers for Eden to show up tomorrow or later that will Presumably annoy Cruz. Mm-hmm. Um, after hiring or after getting her recording, Gina goes back to Cece's room and says, "Cece, next week you're going to be leaving us, and I'm going to my final reward." <laughs> and that is it for episode 320 of Santa Barbara. All right, we'll be back at, after we watch the October 31st aired episode. Will they acknowledge that it's Halloween, or are they still a few days behind? We will see after we watch episode 321. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. Because next week you're going to be leaving us. You're going to your final reward. And I'm finally going to get my reward. dress up as stuff and scary on Halloween like I do? Well, maybe this time I will. As what? How about a witch? Happy Happy Halloween. Halloween! It's Thursday, October 31st, 1985, and it's Halloween. And Santa Barbara airs episode 321. Now, remember, we have been wondering whether or not um, Santa Barbara would have had enough time to uh, rejig their schedule with the three-day three, three day delay that they had. Um, we will find out whether Halloween is acknowledged. But first, uh, Mason and Mary were walking on the beach, as you remember, and they um, end up at Buzz's place, which is a new place we've never seen before, a new set. It's down by the water. It looks like some grubby place where you could get gross seafood. And uh, it's called Buzz's, and it's run by a guy named Pearl. And I was shocked to see Pearl because I did not realize that he was introduced so early on. Mm. And I also thought that Kelly Capwell was the first character to run into Pearl. So I must be thinking about a, a future event. Pearl has a single earring in his left ear, and it's a pearl. Mason uh, points out the Capwell yacht to Mary and invites her to spend some time alone there together because they're having so much trouble finding a privacy. Um, she gets right to the point and says she wants to wait till she gets married. And Mason says he just wants to hold her. Mm. The dress that Mason ordered... Uh, for Mary, eventually arrives at the mansion, and Mason finds that they've actually made two of the dresses, the red one and the blue one, and Mary opts for the blue one, which I think was the risque low-cut one. She does not let him see it. She just pops her head around the door to uh, say that the dress fits. Gina is annoyed to find out that Mason and Mary have been walking on the beach together. Uh, She has also had a copy of Eden's dress made, which she's wearing, underneath her purple blouse. Um, And she tells Cece all about her plans as she gathers the components, the wig, the letter, the recording, which she plays, so we hear the professor's voice uh, again, and a new entry... A digital clock. 
this is this is sort of like when we were building up to Marcello's elevator death, death trap. We just get a little hint of it every episode. Yeah, I'm actually very reminded of that too, and I'm wondering if we'll have a similar sort of trajectory on that, where maybe we'll even get a little bit of a dress rehearsal of it, or we'll get a little bit of a, a an idea of what she's actually got lined up. And then it will somehow be thwarted in some way, which forces her to rapidly do some kind of, of, of work to try and, and uh, revive it or to cover or something like that. Mm -hmm. And usually when you're impro improvising at the last second, that's when Columbo figures out uh, that it was you. Yeah. So not a good idea. But I am also getting a sense um, that whatever happens with Gina's plan with CC, and you know, however that plays out, that uh, there's a good chance that maybe Mason and Mary might be her targets for retribution. After mm. this. She may have another plan after this one if she's not in jail. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, as I am Superman uh, today for Halloween, I'm going to use one of the powers that we first saw him use in Superman 4. It's Halloween in Santa Barbara. Brandon finds Gina carving a pumpkin. And she makes a lot of uh, references to the fact that she uh, is thinking about Eden while carving this uh, evil face into the pumpkin. Yes, and she's quite aggressive with her knife. Too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, the first thing Brandon covers is, oh, who sent all these flowers to Eden? And uh, Gina says, oh, probably one of her boyfriends. <laughs> she has more than one boyfriend? Oh, I imagine. Um, and then Brandon asks Gina why she doesn't dress up for Halloween. And Gina says, I just might dress up like a witch. <laughs> Which is kind of funny. Um, she, um, when Eden calls, uh, Gina picks up the phone and, and Eden says hello before... Gina can answer, so she realizes it's Eden, and she just happens to have in her hand this little, uh, you know, toy that Mason had given Brandon that makes, like, evil cackling sounds, so <laughs> just on the spur of the moment, Gina just plays it into the phone to freak out Eden, and it actually <laughs> quite works. Um, later on, when uh, Eden's over there, Gina takes the opportunity to slip the letter from Cece back into Eden's purse, unseen. Just on the off chance, there'll be some repercussions from that, or possibly as planting evidence. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, Brandon in this episode is being played for the first time by David Zebulon, who will be playing him for three consecutive episodes Ooh. as a fill-in for Brandon Call, who presumably had school or something. Now, it's interesting that um, um, the, the, ep the Halloween stuff seems to be just isolated to the set decoration and the pumpkin carving, mm -hmm. um, possibly because it's happening three days earlier than they planned. So I feel they may have at the last minute decided to have Ted wandering around the house in an ape mask the entire episode and never actually really interact with anyone. Oh, he does jump out and scare. Is it Mason and Mary when they come in? I thought uh, it was Brandon. It could be Brandon. Oh, that's right. He, he, it's Brandon, and then later... He's just skulking around in the background wearing his ape mask while Mary and Mason are in the room, but he never actually, uh, you know, jumps at them. So I wonder if they tried to up the Halloween game a little bit because it was still, you know, wasn't quite planned for, for a Wednesday. Was it an ape mask? I thought it was a lizard mask, but whatever. I don't know. It was, it, was uh, it was something... Toothy. Yeah. But it was great. That was my favorite part of the, the um, episode, actually, was this, this creature sort of lurking around in the background with yeah. Ted popping At up. first we didn't realize, no, it was for, that it was Ted, and he was kind of tall, so I thought, oh, maybe it's Ted. But we hadn't seen T Ted for a few days. I'm like, hmm. And, and it, it was, was but halfway through the episode, so I'm like, would, it, would Ted be on if we haven't seen him yet, you know? So, but then again, Kirk showed up late in the episode, too. So. Uh, Eden tells Cruz that Kirk hanging around in the bathroom while she was taking a bath was perfectly innocent. Um, Nick asks Cruz to help find Dylan. So Cruz actually has to cut the discussion about Eden and Kirk short. Um, uh, Kirk tells Eden that Cruz is wrong for her. And uh, this brings her to 
sort of uh, finally deal with the issue. And she tells him that she's been pretty easy on him so far, but he has to stop. Mm -hmm. um, she loves Cruz. And uh, Gina overhears that whole conversation. Because, of course, that is that has moved from the houseboat to the um, Capwell Mansion by the time that happens. Yeah. Cruz and Nick go to Buzz's, everyone's favorite hangout. <laughs> and Cruz knows Pearl. Yeah, so forget La Mesa, forget State Street Bistro, forget, forget the, the Beach Orient Park. Express, <laughs> now it's Buzz's. Yeah, I don't know, and it's near the water, so I don't wonder if the Beach Bar, you know, will be seen, although it is October, so, although, you know, people were hanging out in their swimsuits in October last year, so. Uh, Pearl, it turns out, is an excellent source of waterfront information. Now, Pearl's got a bit of a, some kind of an accent. I don't know if you can tell what it is meant to be. I don't know. I noticed it came and went a bit. Um, they kind of made remarks about it. Um, but I couldn't really tell what he was going for. It wasn't as thick as I actually remember him having it. So I think it actually gets worse as the years go on. I just remember thinking that guy's probably not really from whatever, wherever the place is that they eventually settle on. But but then again, I didn't really know my U.S. accents that well back then. So we'll see as the years go on uh, if Pearl's accent actually makes sense. Or if the actor even, you know, actually does have an accent because I've never seen him in anything else. So um, It turns out Pearl is the one who ferried Dylan and Sam to Carlo's yacht that morning. And so for a few uh, greenbacks, uh, they are able to talk him into bringing Cruz and Nick out to that same yacht. Also, Pearl points out, a storm is coming. Which, uh, you know, the when they first started showing buses, it looked like a storm was already there, because it was very dark and kind of dingy waterfront place that I would never want to eat at. <laughs> and it was already dark, that's before the, the skies even darkened, so... Yeah, I think that one time we went to uh, Santa Monica Pier and it was rainy and stormy and no one else was there and we trudged to the end and we had, we were soaking wet and had, you know, seafood <laughs> in a dismal yeah. atmosphere. That's, that's kind of the flashback I had when I saw Buzz's Buzz. It looks like the type of place that would be, you know, really greasy and everything would kind of taste like old fish and... Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, these fries taste like fish. Yeah, and you'd probably probably want to take a, a Pepto Bismol pill before and after eating there, I suspect. So Dylan and Sam are brought in to Carlo's main room in the yacht, and Carlo has a bit of a witty banter with them. He says to Dylan, How do you like Santa Barbara? They keep expecting him to talk like Stefano. Um, Dylan and Sam pretend to hold out for a while under torture, but of course the whole thing is a ploy to give up the fake map to Carlo, which they eventually do. Uh, not sure how they were planning to extricate themselves from that, but it's just at around the time that Cruz, Nick, and Pearl show up on the yacht, Cruz identifying himself as a police officer, and Carlo warns Dylan and Sam uh, not to tell the police they've been kidnapped, so in Cruz bursts in, Dylan, you know, just pretends, oh, yeah, we came up to visit our buddy Carlo and having a nice day, and Cruz is a little annoyed that he's not, you know, helping, because uh, they went to all this trouble to find him. Uh, Cruz does take a look at Carlo's passport, and here we have some potential meta uh, dialogue. Cruz says, I have a feeling that I've seen you before. Mm -hmm. uh, did you ever go by another name? This is a nod to all those people who really wanted to be Stefano de Mera, I think. And then Carlo says, I go by the name in my passport. So really, I feel this is Stefano de Mera. And I think sure. Joe Mascolo is playing along with that. So there, that's canon now. <laughs> uh, Cruz is annoyed with Dylan and Sam uh, later at the bar, and he actually st storms off. Um, Nick tells Dylan that he knows that what happened, and that Carlo's probably going to figure it out in a few minutes, right? 
So uh, Dylan is not worried, and he's just his happy-go-lucky self. Doesn't realize that Nick has actually swiped the map from him. So Dylan and Sam leave, and Nick ends up with the real map. So I think uh, Nick's main goal is to have, keep Kelly safe. So do you think he would just go and hand over the map to Carlo to get rid of him and, you know, I get rid know. of the threat? I don't know. I feel like this whole episode uh, does have some potential ramifications in a couple of ways. First of all, next time Dylan gets into trouble with Carlo, I don't think anyone's going to rush to save him. And that could have repercussions if Kelly's involved somehow. So I could see that boomeranging back on them. I'm sure we're going to end up with Kelly tied up on that yacht. Yeah. And Pearl making another midnight uh, uh, rowboat ride out yeah. to rescue her through a porthole. But also, I think with uh, Nick swiping the map, um, well, first of all, when Dylan, you know, won't have it to exchange to Carlo, so uh, not that I care about mm -hmm. him, but that'll put his life in danger, I guess, a bit more. Um, but also, that puts a target potentially on Nick and, and Kelly as well. So if he is going to exchange it to Carlo, he should probably do it quickly, I would think think and not involve Kelly at all before they target him and Kelly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll see if he does the right thing or the smart thing. Uh, Pearl, of course, has been working at this oyster bar for seven years in the hopes of finding a second Pearl so he can make a second earring. And he is extremely annoyed upon returning from the sea to find that Mary has found a Pearl in her oyster. Now, we should just mention as an aside that that pearl probably would not be worth much if the oyster has been cooked, because you'll end up with a very hard... Hmm, non... I did not know that. Yes, yes. So, um, hopefully she was eating a raw oyster. I think Pearl probably also was imagining that if he'd been the cook, you know, on shift at that time, that he would have spotted it during the cooking part and snagged it for himself. Because either way, Mary would have ended up with the oyster, you know, even if he was there. So, but then again, maybe they don't op open them. Maybe you open them yourself. I don't know. Ugh, the whole thing's terrible. I don't want to know why. Why would people do that? <laughs> Not really seafood people. <laughs> well, the first potential problem to Gina's plan arrives is there is a power failure at the Capwell Mansion. Now, I'm thinking about this digital clock that Gina purchased. Could it, in fact, her plan, whatever her plan is with the digital clock, be messed up if the power goes off and the clock gets reset? So, um, Eden, of course, freaks out as soon as it happens, um, but no one else is worried because of the backup generator. Gina knows exactly how everything works there, and the nurses do. Um, but then there is a shocking Halloween twist. Cece's eyes are wide open, and it freaks out Eden. It certainly freaks out Gina. But the nurses are, oh, this is a sort of involuntary muscle spasm that could happen to people in a coma. It's normal. So for the entire episode, every time we see C.C. Charles Bateman has his eyes wide open. It's very freaky. It is. And, you know, sometimes you fall asleep with your <laughs> eyes open, and that, too, is quite freaky. <laughs> Let me die. <laughs> If you hear that, that's a tape that someone's playing. It's not really me telepathically telling you to pull the plug. Um, Eden thinks Cece looks angry with her for not pulling the plug on him. Then Gina has another one of her chats with Cece and says uh, she feels like they're best friends because they can talk. Um, she said, now close your eyes and rest because tomorrow I'm going to lose my best friend. So Gina's plan is happening mm -hmm. tomorrow, or maybe it's tonight after midnight this tomorrow. So uh, we will see within the next few hours, hopefully, how things go with the plan. Now back at the houseboat, Eden tells Cruz that Cece looks angry with her. And then she finds the letter in her purse that she had thrown away and feels it has come back to taunt her, or to haunt her. So, 
I don't know, she's not being drugged anymore, I don't think, but she's so upset by everything that she's like not yeah. thinking clearly as to why this person, this That's letter right. can be in she's, her purse. She is know. getting genuinely near some sort of edge. Mm -hmm. It's not the edge, but she's definitely not herself. I imagine Gino will do something at the party to make Eden have a freak out in front of the people to, mm -hmm. to just well, give evidence that yeah. Eden's, you know, was unstable that night when the things happened. And those were all the things that happened in this Halloween episode of Santa Barbara. And we have now finished 15% of the series. And we did have some credits, cast credits. There is a new entry in the credits, Pearl. Um, Robert, I want to say Taller, because it looks German, T-H-A-L-E-R. And uh, in the second set of credits, this time we are missing Katie Janus and Orient Express, Express Bartender, but we have Carlo again, and we have Brandon David Zebulon. So that is it for the Halloween episode of Santa Barbara. Although, because of the uh, three-day gap, I suspect it'll be Halloween for at least two or three more days on the show. So... That'll be fun, and we'll find out whether Cece survives Gina's plot. We'll see you after we've watched episode 322. Bye-bye. Bye. People say that husbands and wives should be best friends. And you are that to me. you know that? I can talk to you. But all good things must come to an end. So close your eyes and rest. Because tomorrow... I lose my best friend. Do you want to move up to our new apartment today? Sure. All right, we're moving on up. Welcome back. Hello. We finished episode 322 of Santa Barbara, which originally aired Friday, November 1st, 1985. Brick's bail is set at $150,000, but Minx has bailed him out. Minx is not actually in this episode. We rely on Julia to tell us that information. The commissioner tells Brick that he can't leave town. And then Amy realizes that their marriage license is only good in Nevada, so they're scrambling to have their wedding in Santa Barbara. The commissioner and Julia have a chat about Cruz's upcoming promotion. So they're all working to keep it a secret from Cruz, uh, due to Eden's request. Rick and Amy find an empty field to get married in. And there's, uh, I think there's some music playing in the background with this. I I wasn't sure who it was, though. Mm. I don't know. I didn't, no, didn't write anything down. Mm. But uh, we're definitely getting ready for sweeps, I think. I think we'll have a big November wedding before Brick mm -hmm. gets whisked off to trial. Kelly and Julia evaluate the decoration potential of the houseboat. So it should be said that initially when they learned that, um, when they learn that Brick is going to get married to Amy, uh, Kelly very generously offers to pay for the honeymoon to take place at the Capwell Hotel, which sounds pretty darn nice. However, then she gets an even bigger brainstorm that they should use Cruz's boat, since she knows that Cruz is going to be moving into this new place he got. Mm -hmm. And they'll decorate the boat as the honeymoon suite for Brick and Amy. 
I actually thought that was quite a substantial step down and what I really loved about this was Julia obviously thinks the same thing too because you could see throughout the whole scene when Kelly's trying to sell her on this idea and when they're in the houseboat trying to make it look like something that you know you can see that Julia is completely not impressed with this idea mm -hmm. and I have to say that at least for me, Julia was really channeling my thoughts about this too. And this actually really reminded me a lot of when we got married and your mom thought it would be a great idea to decorate the basement for our honeymoon. I could put a curtain up here so no one can see down the basement, she said at one point. We went to the Capri Hotel instead, thanks mm -hmm. to Grandma. Mm -hmm. Um... Uh, at one point, Cruz is contemplating almost telling Eden, uh, Eden about this, the house because she's starting to question where they're going to stay tonight. And he, he ends up saying, well, I, I have a place that's not a, owned by the Capwells. And she's like, oh, we're going to pay one of our competitors to stay at their hotel, is what she's thinking. So, but of course, he has another house in mind. So. Carlo's thug tells Nick that he's got 24 hours to bring Carlo the real map. The thug actually overhears Nick on the phone telling someone that he's got the real map. So, not too bright on Nick's behalf. I think he's putting Kelly in more danger than Dylan at this point. Well, yes, especially since he's the one with the map. And he's the one who's with Kelly, so... Mm -hmm. Charles Bateman is in this episode. He has his eyes closed again and is resting comfortably throughout... Uh, the house is decorated for Halloween, and uh, Gina has sneakily put a skeleton on Cece's door, and a Frankenstein on her own. Uh, Gina wakes up before the alarm. She's excited at this uh, special day she has planned for herself, mm -hmm. and Cece, and Eden. Gina hides the dress in the bear. She's got all sorts of things hidden in that bear. Uh, and she books the presidential suite at the Capwell Hotel for herself and Brandon that night. Mm -hmm. So during the party, they plan to have, I guess, an alibi. Uh, I don't know how she's going to sneak out if Brandon is there, but uh, presumably she's hoping Brandon will be her alibi. Mm -hmm. Well, because Mary is going to the party, there's actually a new nurse uh, who Gina... Uh, quizzes when she comes in and says, oh, I hear that you like watching television and your favorite movies on tonight. And the nurse confirms she's planning to watch uh, TV tonight. Uh, this is great because she'll be a bit distracted. And then uh, Mary has handed Gina the, her pager to hand over to the her replacement nurse. But as we know from the previous episode, Gina has an alternate pager with dead batteries. And Gina hands that one to the night nurse. Mm -hmm. So I think Gina's plan so far is going well. Yes, although I can see where, you know, if this ever comes up for some sort of inquiry, that I'm sure Mary will say something like, oh, I just put new batteries in that in that uh, device before I gave it to her, and, you know, I tested them and everything. Well, but maybe Gina will swap it back if she's That's gonna, true. She's going to be in clever. the house disguised as Eden. Yeah. Um, that may be part of her plan the nurse will have the pager on her, so mm -hmm, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. And then the nurse will say to Cruz, oh, but the pager never went off, and he'll start to investigate how many pagers there are. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's something that could, could be a really instrumental thing, I think, if Gina has somehow gotten it wrong, and the wrong pager ends up in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. There are several potential uh, points where it could go wrong. As we mentioned, there's a she bought that alarm clock, and well, maybe that was just to wake her up. Maybe that was the same alarm clock, just to make sure she wouldn't miss the big day. I don't know. But uh, I thought maybe somehow the alarm clock would be would be involved in setting the time of uh, when Eden was spotted or something by the nurse. So mm -hmm. we'll see, because that power failure we had yesterday might be ongoing. Yes. Now Gina finds in uh, Mason's pocket some Polaroids he took of Mary and, uh, you know, she doesn't say anything because she's Mary uh, Mason's not her top priority for today. She's she's probably filing that away. I think. I um, think so. 
Mason has booked a limo to take Mary around to her various preparations for the party. Uh, massage, hairdresser, nails, etc. And Mason rides along in the limo and waits for her at each of her appointments. After Mary puts on her dress, uh, Gina realizes that uh, she and Mason are going to the party together. Mm -hmm. You're going together, she says. Uh, Mason says, it seemed more economical that way. Gina says, you're being very frugal. I like to see you watching your money. You never know when you're going to need it. <laughs> uh, this is uh, presumably a little dig at the fact that she still has all those documents that could take Mason right out of Capital Enterprises. But uh, everyone's sort of more preoccupied with their other things. So that this is not fully played uh, mm -hmm. as a threat, it's just sort of a taunt. Uh, Mary, of course, overhears it and, and asks uh, if she wants to join them. But Gina tells them that she and Brandon have other plans tonight. It's good that she's solidifying that alibi. Yes, and I think it, at some point she says something about how much they're looking forward to seeing her favorite movie. And it turns out to be From Here to Eternity or something. Mm -hmm. Something that no kid would actually want to watch. I think Mason actually makes a comment about that. Yes, it wasn't that the movie that the night nurse said she was going to watch. Mm -hmm. so it was probably, mm -hmm. uh, it's probably a good. Oh, uh, well, maybe that'll be part of the alibi. If she knows that movie's playing and she's familiar with it, then uh, she she can say she and Brandon watched that movie. Now again, something that could backfire if the station pulls it at the last minute for some reason. Mm hmm. Or if there's a power failure at the station and something. Mm -hmm. Where it happens, yeah. So this could mess up Gina's alibi or her timing. Uh, Mason and Mary arrive at the Orient Express early, and uh, they have an opportunity to dance while Marilyn McCoo is rehearsing. So we have a guest star already. We have a musical guest. Uh, last one we had was uh, who was it that we had at Joan Kelly's wedding? I don't remember who it was, <laughs> but we have another... Uh, I'm sure we commented on it at the time. Mm -hmm. Well, we have another uh, another guest, uh, guest star, presumably uh, an artist who records for a record label that is owned by the same company as NBC, because this just reeks of sort of corporate synergy, which had just been invented back in 1985. Now, we don't actually know what the song is like that she's singing because our copy of this episode had all of that muted including the dialogue that Mason and Mary were saying to each other. I don't think they had any dialogue did they? I thought there Wasn't was one like point the where they were were chatting mm. little, but uh, anyway I I was, don't know. It, at, at any event we didn't hear it. I was typing because I figured they were just dancing anyway. But, I mean I can't imagine it was anything shocking. So, um, yeah, so I imagine in the next episode, uh, we may actually have a lot more blank depth, but it's, uh, well, I don't want to reveal where we're watching these episodes, uh, so that, uh, you know, we don't want to target them, but I think you can guess, uh, who regularly mutes music from episodes. Cruz tears up the letter from CC. After having argued with Eden about the letter once again, Cruz tells Eden that Carmen is coming to the party, who we haven't seen her for a while, mm -hmm. so that'd be nice. Uh, and he then finds out that she hasn't invited Sophia. Uh, she says uh, that he can invite her uh, if, she, if he wants. So he goes over to the cat, well mentioned, to invite her. Uh, he is surprised to find the house so empty and uh, uh, finds Sophia with Cece and Cruz invites her. Uh, then Eden arrives, and Sophia says to Eden that she can't make it. I think she knows that she's not really welcome. Mm -hmm. It's just a courtesy invite. Uh, meanwhile, of course, uh, Gina has this bear full of goodies, uh, which Brandon, uh, which Brandon, uh, which, which belongs to Brandon. So um, Cruz nearly uh, discovers Gina, uh, with the wig, which she quickly hides in the bear, and then when Brandon retrieves his bear, uh, it's a lot heavier than uh, he's used to, and he ends up dropping it, and Eden picks it up for him, mm -hmm. and just comments that it's a little bit lumpy. Yeah. 
then uh, Gina tells Brandon that they've got too much stuff uh, for their one night at the presidential suite and he'll have to leave the bear behind and he, unlike a lot of kids, uh, is not uh, throwing a tantrum at the, mm -hmm. at the thought of leaving his bear. He just says, okay. And Gina hides the bear under one of the chairs in the atrium, presumably so that she can retrieve it uh, later when she sneaks back during From Here to Eternity. Mm -hmm. uh, she does, though, grab the pills from the bear first, because it looks like she will once again be drugging Eden tonight at the party, and uh, that will lead to help with make it look like Eden has gone nuts again, mm -hmm. and perhaps... Mm -hmm. uh, give an excuse for Eden to come home. Uh, I doubt that Gina will volunteer to drive her because that would be too suspicious, but mm -hmm. uh, maybe she has something else planned to keep Eden segregated from Cruz, maybe, because it's got to appear that Eden, you know, Eden's got to be alone so that people think she she did go back to the, the house. So there's probably a little twist um, that Gina has for how she's going to get Eden separated from everyone at the party. Maybe, you know, Eden will check into a room or something to relax, and that will be that will be how she has no alibi. It's already seeming, though, like a very complicated plan. You mm -hmm. know, if the party was being held at the house in some ways, that would be a little bit easier. But um, it probably wouldn't be quite as incriminating as well as if she can actually get Eden to be shown to leave and then somehow make it seem like she was there alone and was the only person who could have um, done whatever is going to happen to Cece. Mm -hmm. Or maybe she's actually planning to have Eden be at home uh, in the dress, but unconscious on her bed. Mm -hmm. Because I know Eden, uh, Gina was measuring out how many feet it was to Eden's room. Um, presumably she wants someone to catch a glimpse of her running towards Eden's room, and then mm -hmm. they can later find Eden in that room. Yeah. So, I don't know where Gina actually will go after she's, first of all, she's got to rehide the dress. Um, second of all, she's going to have to sneak out of the house and get back to the Capwell Mansion. And um, We're still not entirely clear how many staircases there are to the bed bedroom area, but maybe there's, you know, behind the camera, we're always seeing down the hall, Maybe behind the camera, there's a whole another stairwell on that side of the house that, mm -hmm. that someone could use to get downstairs. So Gina says as she leaves the bear under the chair, see you soon. Mm -hmm. So basically, we have only two people in the house, uh, the new nurse and Cece. Mm -hmm. Well played, Gina. I look forward to seeing if your plan works as well as Marcello's. Well, Marcello's plan would have worked if Kelly hadn't suddenly gotten in the middle of it and if he hadn't been concerned about her being in the middle of it. Well, Brandon, I suppose, could mess things up then. He's, she's, he's probably the only one she would be concerned with. Lots of things could mess it up. A uh, uh, ill-timed power failure could mess it up too. I mean, it could could go in in her favor. She could use it, but it could also mess her up. There's also a little twist that Sophia's not at the party. Mm -hmm. She might decide, oh, I'm going to go spend some time with Cece while everyone's gone. And that may be awkwardly timed when uh, Gina and Eden show up, or Eden shows up, or Gina shows up, whichever, however the plan is supposed to go. Well, if you think about real life, there's so many potential weird wild cards that could you know, be part of it too. There's lots of people who live in the Capwell house, you know. Ted could suddenly get a headache and wander off home or, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know. We will see when we watch Monday's episode, episode 323 of Santa Barbara. We'll see you next week. See ya. A little lumpy though. Did you go to the circus and fall in love with a fire eater or possibly a bareback rider? My name is Hans Reiter, and mine is the last voice that you will ever hear. You cannot escape, Lieutenant Capwell. We're moving on up to the top, to 
the deluxe apartment in the sky. We're moving on up to We finally got a piece of the pie.